What's going on, gents? This is part two of Swamp Considerations. This is uh, the planning phase. This is not what I would call sexy, but I think it's some extremely important content if you're planning operations in and around wetlands. Um, I'm going to reference more than anything Met TC in this. Sometimes it'll apply, sometimes it won't, but it'll be the framework for this video. Um, I try to fill in gaps as best as I can, but ultimately a lot of these steps are going to boil down to your specific area. Uh, I'm going to make a lot of references to the American South because that's areas I'm familiar with, but by all means, some of this is going to apply to you, some of this won't. I'm trying to uh, hit as many points as I can. Uh, most of these are from my own personal lessons learned uh, from living and training around wetlands. Uh, be it South Florida and South Slap, <coughs> excuse me, South Floridian Everglades, to uh, being in Fort Benning's swamps, to uh, just kind of mucking about around Alabama and Mississippi as well, and other parts of Florida. So, without further ado, let's begin. So, the uh, the first, I'll start with Med TC. Uh, the first letter stands for mission. This is probably going to be one of the more nebulous letters for most of you. Um, I can't really write it for you. Uh, your own overarching situation is going to dictate this more than anything. Uh, my situation is going to be very different than your situation, and we ultimately cannot uh, read the future. Um, some of you might be dealing with evacuating from a hurricane, so your mission is evacuation, bugging out, whatever you want to call it. Some of you might be concerned with civil unrest, rioting, uh, even foreign invasion, who knows. Therefore, your mission set's going to be completely different. Uh, most of us, it's going to boil down to survive. But, you know, some of us can, you know, some of y'all can thrive more than survive. And you'll probably want a greater effect on your landscape, even if it is just, you know, pacifying the area or defending your own property, etc., etc. <clears throat> um, there are some missions that are a little bit better suited for wetlands. In my opinion, foraging is probably best. Uh a lot of people would be surprised at how much wildlife, even from like just a hunting perspective, at least down here in the Everglades, there's a lot of meat compared to how much effort you might have to put in. Of course, this is already area dependent, and if some massive calamity happens, expect a lot of that meat to disappear. But, <clears throat> you know, it is what it is. You, um, you'll probably be better off hunting big game or hunting for a significant, you know, a a quantitative meat source in a wetland over maybe a housing complex unless you know I don't know how you guys act but anyways uh, like I said mission most of this you guys are gonna have to develop on your own uh, and it's gonna be chances are it's probably not gonna focus too much on the wetlands unless it's foraging or running away or hiding or evacuating or doing whatever most of it's probably gonna center around urban areas just because of expedited travel and whatnot but i i just figured i'd mention it because it is in my opinion somewhat important and it is the first letter so as always most of what you're going to do is going to depend on that first m like what are you trying to accomplish and uh, just understand that the wetlands are a tough area to operate in i've said this before i'll say it again it is not for someone who just who just went camping for the first time uh it's it's got a lot of burdens it's got a lot of little nuances that you need to take into account so whatever you're planning for just understand that your mission needs to play within the parameters of the environment more than anything <clears throat> the enemy phase isn't really what you would consider a, uh, a not always a traditional enemy um, for a lot of us we really don't have a direct armed op opposing force uh, most of it is either just like what it, what if ism or just kind of like kind of brainstorming like hmm who could potentially be a problem if x happens but what i can't say for sure is that the ever-present enemy in wetlands is going to be the environment uh, flora fauna and just the pretty austere conditions of the wetlands um yeah you're surrounded by water but depending on what type of wetlands you're in there's nothing to drink so dehydration is a risk uh couple that with extreme heat and you have a ton of problems that 
can bring a patrol down faster than a sniper could. Um, and it's almost always going to be present no matter what, even if it's a presence patrol, even if it's, you know, even if you're just hiking with your friends and you just, some of you guys are carrying long guns, the environment will never be your friend in the wetlands. It is, I'm not going to say it's out to get you, but it's always going to be there and it's always going to be something you need to consider. So take survival classes, you know, study the area, understand that you need to be hydrated all the time, understand you need to bring enough supplies, understand that it, it is not somewhere for the faint of heart. That being said, this isn't a survival video. Uh, there have been a lot of historically armed groups within wetlands. Uh, I'll touch upon the more, the more likely hunters and fishermen and law enforcement later. Uh, some, uh, some historical, like, armed groups, or at least groups that aren't going to be your friend, or aren't going to be happy to see you, <clears throat> have mostly been, um, drug cartels, uh, smuggling elements, armed smuggling, you know, even human trafficking. They've, they've used, at least in the American South, they've used significant portions of the wetland terrain to hide out, to use it as ingress and egress points in and out of the country, to uh, have grow ops. Um, a lot of them would even build airstrips. They would dredge portions of the swamp and create airstrips so they could land, you know, Cessnas in the middle of the night, unload drug or weapon cargo or load up cargo that they want to bring out of the U.S. and somewhere else. <clears throat> A lot of uh, a lot of wetlands have been used for bootlegging, you know, moonshining, that sort of thing too. Anything where someone wants to create illicit substances in secret, uh, the wetlands, because they're not exactly the funnest area to patrol or hike through. A lot of these criminal elements, criminal enterprises, even just one-off guys just trying to grow a little weed for themselves, they're going to they're going to probably look at wetlands as a safe haven. So you need to understand that in your planning process that while you may be out there and you're not really looking for a fight, you might stumble across something that whoever sees you stumble across it is not going to be happy. And while I, while more often than not, they know this and they know that every once in a while you might come across some sort of like rando hiker that just stumbles upon something they shouldn't. If you're out there patrolling in full kit with uh, six, seven dudes, and they see that, they're gonna think you guys are the police. So just bear that in mind. They might, you know, they might surrender, they might run away, they might decide to stay and fight. So don't think that just because it's a training patrol that there isn't some sort of threat out there. And even if it isn't a training patrol, even if you're fully aware, fully armed, fully kitted, whatever, understand that you might have what you think is the enemy, but there might be other groups that think you're the enemy. And uh, they've always been there. Uh, using wetlands as safe havens for crime it predates most of most of you guys viewing this is probably probably lives honestly uh, I can say that for sure at least most of you guys in your 20s uh, the 70s and 80s a lot of drug smuggling at least in Florida there are still airstrips out there that you know with satellite imagery they've sort of gone away but there are still areas out there that very much show those signs of, you know, old 80s cocaine smuggling from South America. So just understand that <clears throat> the wetlands do pose safe havens for those groups. And this isn't just to say that South Florida is the only place. Um, along the U.S.-Mexico border, you have the Rio Grande. And, you know, don't think that some of those lower-lying areas aren't tepid, swampy, bogs, whatever you want to call them. Those are wetlands too, and while they might be patrolled by law enforcement, they're probably also, you know, depending on how traversable they are, they're probably going to be areas where, you know, coyotes, so to speak, and human traffickers are going to be moving their, uh, their human product in and out of the U.S., so just bear that in mind. I mean, <clears throat> you know, understand that these groups are not your friend unless you're part of them. And even then they don't know who you are and they're all they're going to see is dudes in camouflage with long guns or, you know, even dudes dressed in drab colors with firearms or even just a large group of young military age men. And they are, 
they're going to come to some pretty weird conclusions pretty quickly uh, just because Occam's razor or whatever you want to say. They'll just kind of realize like, well, you know, they might be cops. They might not be cops. They might be a rival cartel. They might not be a rival cartel. Either way, I'm going to handle it this way. So just bear that in mind. Um, what's a little more likely, though, if you are going to come across quote unquote enemy is someone trying to hide something. Uh, I can say personally, I've come across a lot of destroyed, joy-ridden vehicles in my own area, just burnt out cars filled with bullet holes, or I've come across brand new cars with dealer tags that are just poking out of a canal. Someone joy rid them and then they threw them in neutral and let them just kind of drive themselves into the water to get rid of them once they were done with their little trip. So understand that you might come across someone just trying to get rid of evidence. God forbid, you know, a dead body or something related to a murder or someone trying to find somewhere secluded to do whatever they want to do. I know it's not a crime, but I've come across people in their cars having sex before just thinking, you know, oh, this is a secluded area. I'm out here. It's a swamp. Who else would be here? And it's like, oh, you'd be surprised. So bear that in mind. Um, there's a lot of people that want to go into the wetlands because they think no one's going to be out there. So even just someone that did something that they shouldn't have and they're trying to, you know, ditch a gun or ditch a knife or ditch a vehicle or even a body, just understand that they also might be out there. And uh, you're more than likely going to find, while it's petty crime, you very well may find signs of, you know, someone joyriding a boat, someone stealing something and then deciding like, I'm done with it, it's time to ditch it. And you know, you come across them, again, they might think you're cops if you're in it with a group. If you're alone, they might think they can overpower you or they might, you know, who knows how that interaction is gonna be. So just bear that in mind. It might not always be a violent interaction, but it's always gonna be an interaction that'll have you testy. <clears throat> that being said, um, well, I said that that's the most likely. Discovery is probably your greatest enemy if you are going to be in full battle rattle patrolling. There's a lot of outdoorsmen that called the wetlands their home. I wouldn't call them hostile actors by any means. Nine times out of ten, depend. most of you guys reading this will probably be sympathetic to you. But that being said, you never know. You can always get that one guy that just decides like, oh, there's people with guns out here. You know, someone acting super boomer-like. And they'll call the police because, you know, they, they want... They want to make a mountain out of a molehill, so just understand that, and it doesn't take a lot to uh, spoil a patrol, even just a regular interaction might, uh, <laughs> might gain the attention of some of the other groups that patrol the wetlands. Law enforcement, for instance, park rangers and game wardens, they'll, I'm not going to call them enemies in the traditional sense, but they will 100% if you're doing if you're doing something really suspect out there. You, you stand that risk of arrest, you stand that risk of detainment. And I'm not saying, you know, you need, to, you need to treat them as bad guys or anything. They're doing their jobs. And, you know, however you feel about that, they're going to see you and they're going to either... They're going to either, you know, call for backup or they're going to call for a helicopter, call for whatnot. So... <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> understand that that'll create issues for you. And that's not even the, that's not even LEO on the ground. You know, you might get, that's not talking about just pickup trucks filled with game wardens or, <clears throat> you know, fish cops, whatever you want. Understand that law enforcement by and large has been using Cessnas and drones more and more lately because it's a lot easier to patrol a wide area with a Cessna than it is just a truck that's limited to roads. So understand that those overflights of preserves and wildlife refuges are common, at least where I live. And you, you have no idea what's on that plane. It could be thermal, it's night vision, who knows. Uh, I'm not going to say they're going to be using stingrays on just empty woods, but you, you have no idea. So just bear that in mind. Understand that you need to have SOPs to deal with every one of these groups, even if it's probably should be just avoidance for all of them, but, you know, you need to have SOPs, you know, the cover story, alibi, if you cut, if you get discovered, you get, you get call your pants down, and you need to come up with a quick explanation, I, I mean, I know it's stupid, but even the whole, like, I'm out here training for airsoft is dumb as hell, and a cursory search is going to prove that that's wrong, but at the very least, it's a story, and it'll explain some of your camouflage, that being said, you guys are creative, you'll figure it out.
um, understand that because wetlands are mostly wet, that uh, you're, you're going to come across not really car patrols. You're probably not going to have a Crown Vic or a Dodge Charger roll up on you. It'll probably be a pickup truck of some sort or airboats or depending on if you're in a coastal area. I know if you're in the Everglades around the 10,000 Island area, you'll definitely have less airboats and you're going to have more real boats, you know, with outboard motors and things like that. <clears throat> so understand, like figure out, you got to kind of do your own area study figure out what the the presence mostly is around your area and then avoid those routes or if you have to cross those routes for whatever reason just understand that you need to treat them like LDAs or linear danger areas and um, have SOPs for that accordingly um, I know at least through my area a lot of the roads are uh, gravel roads and this kind of dipping into terrain a little but a lot of these gravel roads with soft tires, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hear them. I've had trucks pretty much just sneak up on me, and I, I was paying attention just because I wasn't looking. I was walking one direction, and I wasn't really. Uh, I was kind of being lazy and not looking around as much as I should have. Pickup truck with you know regular soft tires will sneak up on you, even on a gravel road. Uh, you usually hear the gravel once you're behind it, but you don't hear it when it's coming towards you. So just bear that in mind. Um, if you are going to take roads, just uh, don't always rely on sound. Uh, if you have a drone, that's a good way to kind of get that bird's eye view and get some early warning. Um, just, you know, understanding that you shouldn't be on those areas because they are patrolled more than anything. So, yeah. <clears throat> like I said, uh, just to reiterate, your enemy probably will be the environment or no will assuredly be in the environment all the time but it'll probably mostly err towards discovery more than anything but i would be i'd be lying to you if i didn't say that you know there are a lot of crime crime elements that have called wetlands home for hiding so just bear that in mind to absolutely no one's surprise the uh the next section is terrain uh pretty much the focus of all of this I, i'm kind of I could have just put this all into terrain because I am talking about wetlands, but I figured, you know, I can give you some extra info. It doesn't really hurt anyone. Um, I've said this a million times. Uh, the wetlands are a very arduous, difficult area to survive in, to plan around, to patrol through. You're you're dealing with extremely saturated conditions. I mean, just here in this in this uh, map of the Everglades, understand that all of the salt water here is uh is going to be filled by all of the water coming down through here all of this could be brackish water all of it could be some of it could be fresh water a lot of it could be salt water it all depends but just um just understand that it's extremely saturated so you're going to be wet and if your equipment isn't set to be soaking wet you know refer to my first video for more of the equipment side of things um understand that not only is it just going to be uncomfortable to be in these areas, but you're going to need special equipment. Uh, river crossings, canal crossings, you're probably going to need ropes, uh, even inflatable boats or rafts or, you know, whatever you can come up with. You're going to need to train for that too. Um, you're going to need to be prepared for significant and quick changes in weather. Uh, between just ambient temperature while it usually in my area it's hot during the day and then less hot at night some areas I know are hot during the day and then they get cold at night so you have to plan for both uh, my area instead of being you know instead of having significant temperature changes you have significant precipitation changes it'll go from extremely sunny to a little windy and cloudy to torrential downpour for one two hours and then it'll go right back to sunny and this is all within the span of maybe four hours so it's uh the wetlands like to play off extremes a lot <clears throat> there's much to say for operational planning um the biggest draw like i said with the enemy portion is that people tend to avoid wetlands because as i said it is uncomfortable the discomfort <clears throat> is going to you know while it might put you at odds with anyone else who's out there trying to hide the, the fact of the matter is is that most people aren't going to want to be out there specifically during summer when all the mosquitoes and horseflies 
are out in full force. Most people don't want to put themselves in a fetid, insect-infested, gator-ridden bog. So this will help any planning, you know, op any operations, any patrols, etc. You'll have that that secrecy of movement a lot easier through a wetlands than, let's say, if you're trying to hike through the Smoky Mountains or something where there's going to be a bunch of people taking trails trying to look at bears. <clears throat> Especially the further you get from population centers, you're going to get that benefit of secrecy of movement. Um, you know, you're probably going to be worse off patrolling around here than you are around here just because the most population centers around there. But that's kind of obvious. Um, depending on where you're at, the wet terrain can be bountiful. Uh, I know in some areas around here, fresh water just seeps out of the ground, or at least filterable fresh water. Um, heavy downpours and precipitation, you can get fresh water that way. So that'll really ease your logistical burdens, of course, so long as you have purification and filtering equipment, or you decide to take the take the time to fill, you know, boil your water, filter it the old fashioned way. Um, waterways are filled with a ton of fish, reptiles, mammals, you name it. So if you ever do turn to foraging, if you're on an extremely long patrol, you'll, if you're smart and you know what to look for, low lying areas, uh, depending on what you're trying to get, waiting for, waiting around game trails leading to watering holes, you, you can supplement your, uh, whatever food you pack in with whatever you can get out there. Now, uh, that, that's a story for another time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and teach you how to hunt, but just understand that the wetlands have quite a bit of animal life that is for the most part edible. Not only that, um, a lot of reeds, cattails, uh, berries grow along the shorelines of a lot of them, a lot of these uh, more established waterways. And you can eat those, you can use them to supplement your diet, you can use them, you know, in a pinch and survival or even just for whatever other qualities they have. So just understand that while, while I always say that the wetlands are kind of terrible, there there is a way to thrive out there and there is there are ways to kind of supplement your patrol's diet, supplement your, you know, make sure that your patrol's hydrated if you know what to look for, as always. <clears throat> While equipment needs to be specialized to thrive, uh, like I said in part one, high drainage, hydrophobic materials, lightweight materials, things like that. This also applies to any of your adversary forces. So they will be, any adversary out there is going to be dealing with these same exact conditions you are. Um, so understand that if you've done a good study on your adversary and you know that they're pretty squeamish or weak, they probably will not be having extended duration uh, patrols or operations out in the wetlands. So this makes even, even if it's a very small localized wetland environment, it makes it a safe haven for patrol bases, LPOPs, um, objective rally points, etc. because no one wants to go there. So if you're the, if your patrol is the tough patrol that will go anywhere, no matter what, uh, use that to your advantage. You'll go where no one else will. Um, historically, uh, pretty big example in American history, Francis Marion, they called him the Swamp Fox, and uh, his safe haven was, to no one's surprise, the, the swamps of South Carolina, which he would use to great effect. He would hide in them, he would refit in them, he would use them to move troops around because the British just didn't want to move through swamps as much. They would rather stick to roads, and even when they went off the beaten path, they really weren't familiar with it as much as the... Uh, the colonial militia or Marion's troops were so you know just a quick if you want to read more about that there's a ton of books ton of literature but just a proven historical example that probably applies to all you guys in the American South <clears throat> understand that uh if you can master the water crossings and uh figure out how to use them to your advantage as delay features you're going to be able to control anyone who can't um Ambushes across waterways can create far ambushes, even if it's an ambush initiated with 100 meters. What I mean by that is if you ambush on one side of a deep canal to, uh, here, I'll just draw it out for you. If you ambush from one side of a deep canal 
to a force that's on the other side, you stand to gain. Um, you basically remove their ability to turn and burn. So we'll call that a waterway. These are your forces in a linear ambush. And then enemy patrol moving this way. You know, if your force starts that linear ambush across the canal, even if they even if they traverse to meet you head on, they cannot cross across that canal. Whereas you're already shooting at them. You, you know, the battle is being done completely off of your timing, your decision, etc. They're surprised, and I know, at least for the U.S. military, a lot of the tactics for near ambushes are turn and burn. Well, this creates a situation where you cannot turn and burn. So just bear that in mind. Uh, those waterways are shitty to cross, and they're especially shitty to cross in a situation where you don't have the time you don't have the security and safety to set up a, you know, a regular water crossing. Couple that, uh, couple that ambush with just the fact that because the area is so saturated, you have mud along the banks of any waterway or even just in general. That mud really does slow down your movement. It makes movement much more labored. And then that plus vegetation that's there, mostly reeds. And you really don't have the opportunity to just kind of run across or run quickly through the terrain reacting to an ambush so just bear that in mind that the vegetation will slow people down it'll slow your own patrol down but it also slows down your adversaries so you know be smart plan around it be <clears throat> be ingenious understand that that mud and dense aquatic vegetation uh will 100 percent burden any force so you in your own planning have to account for delays. Uh, what what would have been even with a good pace count, what would have been a a two hour patrol through the bush might turn into a three four hour patrol. You might double your time. You might even triple it, depending on how cautious you're trying to be, how much counter tracking you're doing. So just understand that those delays are possible. So have have somewhat loose timelines if you're going out into an area for the first time because. The, the thick mud, the deep mud, even just the, the tackiness of the ground and the, the density of reeds and sawgrass, elephant grass, even sugarcane plantations that are out through the south, those will slow down your patrol. Um, they hide your movement well, but you have to fight them every step of the way. Uh, ask me <clears throat> because I've done it many times just trying to hike through sawgrass and it is you know, 200 meters feels like a mile sometimes. So understand that you have to trample that. Even if you use a machete, um, it's going to be pretty obvious even from the sky. So while you might be tempted to just kind of clear cut a path through, understand that we don't live in, we don't live in a time where we can just ignore any aerial observation, you know, high altitude planes, drones, even just civilian planes and quadcopters and things like that satellite imagery will eventually show where you've patrolled through and that's just walking through if you clear cut it it's going to definitely show where you were so understand that that's going to the, the environment poses its own threat to uh tracking and counter tracking so if you're going to if you decide you're going to clear brush just understand that that that's going to that's going to be a telltale sign um there's a ton of waterways so some of you guys might be served extremely well by having some sort of watercraft option, folding canoe, folding raft, uh, an inflatable raft, even if you have ribs accessible to you or regular boats, air boats. Uh, just wait, oh, make sure to weigh the reward of that expedited, unfatigued movement versus the uh, significant profile that all of those have. Uh, obviously something motorized is going to be a lot louder and probably sitting a lot higher off the water than an inflatable raft that you're just using ore power to move. Um, this also applies to any motorized movements, pickup trucks, SUVs, ATVs, side-by-sides, uh, dirt bikes, etc. Um, understand that 
all of those vehicles are going to have are going to be under some sort of greater burden than if you know for a boat if it was in open water or if a truck was on a road understanding the environment poses a much greater burden on those parts um <clears throat> so if you don't have the experience and you don't like even just fixing vehicles or driving navigating that terrain if you don't have the experience and you plan on using vehicles the wetlands is not forgiving to vehicles either uh, i used to off-road a ton in this area and it's very it's very common to come across a bunch of recoveries just hitting a simple two three mile trail it's pretty common to have a mud go where it shouldn't start uh jamming up <clears throat> jamming up parts of the vehicle uh just the vacuum of cleared mud kind of like seeping back in sucking tires in and now you need a recovery vehicle or you need to start digging and shoving max tracks in if it's a wheeled vehicle or your propellers might get bogged down if you're in a motor boat <clears throat> things like that just understand that if you are going to do any sort of motorized patrol spare parts recovery vehicle and the experience to install both are going to be important <clears throat> well many wetlands have undulating terrain within the u.s wetlands tend to be lower lying or coastal so you're going to come across some problems with terrain association <clears throat> oops excuse me if you look at this map you'll notice pretty quickly that something is missing uh, from most terrain maps that is contour lines there are no contour lines on this map why because this area is flat. Therefore, those of you, including myself, that used to uh, rely handily on terrain association, if you get into a big swampland, understand that it's going to be extremely difficult to terrain associate. Places like the Flat Everglades, for example, uh, there's no elevation to gauge off of, so your point men, your navigator, whatever, you're, you're gonna have to use GPS or you're going to have to have a solid pace count you're going to have to self-check quite a bit, um, or you're going to have to be able to find novel points to associate off of, to get, you know, triangulate your position, get your bearings, etc. <clears throat> um, what I do, what I personally do, and it's not perfect, but what I try to do is I try to cross-reference. I basically, if I know I'm going to be patrolling through an area, I'm going to cross-reference what I can see from satellite imagery, you can usually find man-made structures, uh, power line, antennas, and uh, locks on canals, survey stations, even just water depth stations. Sometimes you'll be able to see them from satellite imagery. Try to get a grid to them. Try to put that in your overlays and your notes when you're on patrol. And while you don't have mountains, hills, cliffs, valleys, etc., to gauge to gauge direction off of those man-made spots for the most part aren't going to be removed often or they're not going to be moved that being said after storm anything's possible a, a big hurricane at least in my area is going to ruin that sort of like it, it might move stuff it might push stuff completely underwater etc those of you near waterways uh, specifically coastal waterways you're you're going to have the added benefit of having all those uh water navigation points, buoys or channel markers, even just signs. If you can cross-reference those signs with satellite imagery and you're going to be by the coast, you can use those to cross-reference your own location to some degree. Uh, most of those posts, at least on channels, channel markers aren't really set to move. They're kind of dug into the ground and set to stay there because they're marking a feature that doesn't change often, if at all. So those, if you can spot them through whatever satellite imagery you want or if you can spot them in person and get a bearing to them get a go up to them and get a specific grid use those as landmarks even from the shore they can help you know you can backtrack and get the back azimuth to them and you can kind of figure out where you are so try playing with that uh some of you guys might just be thinking like, well, I can use rivers and roadways and those will be adequate enough to kind of cross-reference, you know, a lot of bendy roads, a lot of waterways that kind of have significant features that you can gauge off of and are pretty easy to spot. 
Um, they're not always visible at ground level, so especially with thick vegetation. So in those cases, you, you might just have to kick someone out to go do the extra legwork, figure out where it's at, and understand they might get lost. I like to use a drone for wayfinding. Uh, I'll cover that in a video later at some point, but I like using drones for wayfinding more than anything. They're pretty good as like a quick little send the flight out, get a gauge on where you're at, and then recall it back. They'll, they'll mind that you need to balance that with the signature of the drone and whatnot, but because of that, you, you're going to... It, it's a good it's a good little handy thing to have, and if you're not super worried about discovery and you do get lost, just understand that you fly that drone up, you're going to have that bird's eye view. You can cross-reference that with your satellite imagery pretty well, depending on how fly, high the drone can fly and how you know, how well you can control it and kind of know what you're looking at. <clears throat> the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, regarding terrain is just, I'm not an expert tracker by any means, but just brief tracking and counter tracking. Um, understand that because mud and wetland grasses, specifically sawgrass, elephant grass, and reeds, cattails, because they're so prevalent, Tracking from land or the air can be pretty easy. Uh, if your patrol has to take steps to kind of either deceive those tracking parties, such as con conducting dog legs on your patrol, or you know sometimes branching out into water, water routes. Uh, understand that you you could you you can be tracked somewhat easily. Um, obviously, mud you're going to leave boot prints. There's not much you can do about that other than try to avoid mud. You know take. Take odd paths on your route. Make sure that you're in employing those counter tracking strategies, you know, taking waterways or, you know, doubling back or, you know, things like that. Um, at least in my area, wetlands are flat and they are sparse with overhead cover. Uh, you'll have the islands of trees. We call them hammocks here. And they're just these small little islands of trees that are probably the only overhead cover. And then around those is just grassland that's pretty easy to spot from the sky. So you, you need to make sure that you can reduce your signature from above as well. Uh, moving under overhead cover, moving at night, although that some doesn't help with thermals as much. But having thermal shielding, being able to have thermal blankets. I heard a curious story from Ukraine. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but a unit was using insulated uh, pads and holding them above their head and basically creating that little thermal block between them and you know, they knew there was a drone or a helicopter in the area with thermals and they were just kind of putting that above their head and it was hiding that signature. I, I'm not going to recommend that because I have no idea if it works or not. If it does, cool. If it doesn't. Then you know you're you're gonna you're gonna learn the hard way, unfortunately. So just bear that in mind. Um, my area doesn't have a lot of overhead cover, so a lot of patrols are jump from one covered area to another covered area to another covered area. But if you're in a bog that's just nothing but trees, you know it's less of a problem. Just understand that those waterways don't have that tree cover, so you're gonna have to plan around that or skirt the edges where the trees do overhang. <clears throat> just understand that, you know. We, we live in the 21st century, and everyone has a way to look from the air now, including you, if you go buy a drone. So, just bear that in mind. Moving on to the troops portion. Um, obviously, most of you guys aren't going to be able to have uh, easy pickings with who your troop portion is going to be composed of. Uh, most, most guys are just going to be able, you know, you get... You make friends with who you make friends with, whether they're an office worker, they work at a gas station mechanic, they're a, you know, a venture capitalist or a hunter, a fisherman, whatever. You, you don't really get to pick your troops as much, but whatever whatever force you're, you're, you're picking or if you get to recruit from, I'll cover that in a bit, that's what you got. But at the very least, people can change some stuff about them. For one, uh, whatever force you're going to have that composes the patrol, you want them to be physically fit. You want them to be able-bodied. So you don't want dudes that are, you know, you don't, uh, 
sorry to guys that just can't walk because they have like previous injuries or they you know can't manipulate a firearm or can't wear a, bat, a pack for extended periods of time. Those aren't going to be the guys you're going to want to take up patrol. So just kind of looking inward, understand that. Uh, you're going to want guys of strong mental constitution, um, dudes that can can kind of like deal with all the problems of the wetlands. They a big one is just kind of like ignoring discomfort or at least knowing how to deal with it for extended durations. Wetlands, you're going to be wet a lot of the time. It's in the name. Uh, your feet are going to be wet. Your feet are going to be soggy. All of your equipment's going to be waterlogged. It's going to be heavy. Uh, you're going to have chafing. There's going to be insects everywhere, bugs, horse flies. They're going to be flying around your ears, flying around your face, biting you, landing on you, making noise. Um, so you're going to want guys that have either the experience in this environment or they're of that like sort of discipline or mental, mental constitution to where they can ignore these issues because the last thing you want is, uh, you know, an hour into the patrol, someone that keeps swatting flies around their face because you just walk through an area filled with horse flies and now they're making a ton of noise down there doing the, the crazy dance and they're now making, you know, a ton of commotion and that's the last thing you want if this is a reconnaissance patrol and your goal is to be, you know, secretive. So, you know, if if you can either get your guys the experience in swampy areas to where they start ignoring these, you address it equipment-wise, whichever way you want to do, or you just recruit, if you can, people who already have experience with this stuff. So they already know that, you know, they already know there's going to be bugs out there. They already know there's going to be snakes out there. They know they're going to be wet. Those are going to be guys that you might want to either create or recruit. Um, examples of that, uh, outdoorsmen are the big one, especially outdoorsmen familiar with those areas. Uh, my ideal pool from what I've seen are people who hunt in wetlands tend to be the best of all worlds. E even if their shooting ability isn't the greatest, they, they know that they have to go through shitty terrain. They have to slog through waist deep water. They have to do all of that just to, you know, get their prize, put food on the table, whatever they have to do. Uh, duck hunters know they have to be out there all day rowing. Fishermen are the same way. Uh, I know myself personally have hiked to some spots just to try and see if the, that area of the water of the waterway that I'm skirting is going to have good peacock bass or, you know, whatever I'm trying to fish for that day. And sure enough, the hardest parts to get to are the ones that tend to have the most fish. So a good fisherman probably knows this and they'll at least have some experience with the area and dealing with those problems. Uh, Off-roaders are another one. Uh, knowing that the, I can tell you this from experience, you get stuck out there and those trails aren't nice trails at least in my area they tend to just be created by trucks driving through them over and over again so when you dismount it's very it's very common to, to just be like knee deep in mud walking through an area that has never had any mosquito or horsefly treatment so they're just buzzing around your face they're biting you you're covered in mud you're you're just trying to you're all you're trying to do is hook a toe strap but you don't have to do this under i'm not going to say duress but like you're, you're definitely having to do this under a lot of other factors that are trying to take your attention away from what you're doing and are nothing but annoying. That being said, um, these are the more obvious ones, but some less obvious ones, at least in my area, a lot of power lines crisscross uh, the swamps. So linemen, I know a, lot, a ton of linemen that have a lot of experience just kind of driving out there, kind of having to be a little bit independent. It's not the same experience. They're not slogging through mud. But they're definitely out there in the elements trying to, you know, rig up power lines, repairs, whatever you need. And they're they're out there just as much. As are dredging crews, at least in my area for canals, those guys are no strangers to being exposed to the same elements that you would be on patrol. And then kind of obvious game wardens. Yeah, I know they drive around in trucks all day or they're in boats, but sometimes they have to dismount, you know. They're And they're out there. They might have like a cursory or... Uh, probably more than cursory, probably a pretty good idea of where all the roads are out there, where people tend to congregate, etc. So those might, if you can recruit from those pools, those might be some of the pools you want to recruit from.
Um, you're going to want to cross train a ton. Uh, whoever has experience with the area, you're going to have to cross train those who don't have experience. Uh, your simple things like wildlife identification are pretty good. You know, these are areas that alligators and snakes tend to congregate in. You know, if you see a log and it's coming towards you, it's probably not a log. It's probably a gator. Um, you know, familiarizing with edible fa uh, edible flora of the area. You know, you can get a cattail and you can cook it this way this time of year. You can you can dig up certain plants and you can eat the roots, things like that. Uh, pretty funny one that dude should be cross trained. Then if you're going to be in the wetlands, uh, swimming, swimming is pretty important. Uh, there, sometimes the only way to cross the canal is to throw your stuff from one, you know, ferry your stuff from one into another and then swim across. Or if you're the point man, you know, there's not always going to be a rope set for you. Someone's going to have to swim out there and set up a rope so that people can cross or at least dangle from the rope or hook their equipment to and shuck it down with carabiners. So guess what? You need to know how to swim. So there, there's, there's some skill sets that you're, you're going to want to kind of cross train all your guys with. Uh, obviously the natural martial ones, land navigation, you know, marksmanship, things like that. But even just identifying animals is a big one. Uh, you're going to want a, a ton of education on hydration, you know, dudes knowing what they're looking at when they're peeing, knowing they're dehydrated, knowing they have to take in salts, fluids, whatever. You're going to want to work on all those skill sets and cross train them as soon as possible before your guys are out there. Or when you're training, you know, make sure that you're covering everything and you're getting valuable lessons when you're out there. It's not just patrolling, it's patrolling in a wetland. So tailoring your patrol, your lessons learned, and your, your little hip pocket training while out on your training patrol are all going to have to play into that. Moving on, um, the time portion. This is kind of brief. It, it's not really, there's not really too much time-wise that's going to be different in most wetlands you guys are going to be exposed to as opposed to anywhere else. Um, the, the time metric is going to be a greater metric in terms of season. Uh, in my area, you have a wet and a dry season. Uh, if you are going to boil it down, if you want something to consider when you're timing your day-to-day -day or your, the duration of your patrol, um, understand that you're going to want, if it is somewhere like in the American South, you're going to want to start your patrols. If you're going to start them in the dark, you're going to do your infill. You're going to want to start them not during dawn and dusk, because that's when they're out and about. Uh, predators, biting insects, they come out dawn and dusk. You're going to want to do the start those patrols before dawn and before or and after dusk the reason being is not only are you insulating yourself from mosquitoes but that flat terrain tends to light up a lot quicker than more mountainous terrain at least in my experience so when the sun starts rising it gets very bright very quickly and when the sun starts setting you can wait the little bit of time for the sun to fully set and you get darkness um, but mostly it's to avoid mosquitoes and all the predators out there. Uh, gators, funny enough, crocodiles tend to be out and about a little more when it's dark. But they tend to start moving around dusk uh, and dawn. So just understand that. Uh, seasonal concerns, like I mentioned. Uh, wet season, you tend to get afternoon showers pretty often in my area. So understanding that if you're going to be out in the afternoon, you need to bring wet weather gear. I know most of you guys probably going to end up with patrols that are going to take all day so you're going to need wet weather gear because those afternoon showers thunderstorms they do happen especially during the, the summer and spring um but don't think that you need to always avoid those times uh, a good thunderstorm while it's not super safe or always super smart to plan around a good thunderstorm is going to be a good time to move because Observation is going to be difficult. Uh, any sound you're going to make is going to be concealed by, you know, the, the, the water coming down. And uh, funny enough, it tends to ground a lot of aircraft. And any, any fair weather patrollers out there are probably going to hunker down in vehicles or hide under ponchos. So if, you're, if your group is the group that doesn't give a shit about getting soaking wet and doesn't give a shit about lightning or thunder, those are good times to move. 
because no one else wants to move in them. Uh, planes can't operate, helicopters can't operate as well in them, or at all, depending. So those are times when you can kind of move, I'm not going to say with impunity, but you can be a little bit more, a little bit more risky, I'd say. That being said, of course, you know, you are running whatever risk you're running by being waterlogged and exposed to lightning. So understand too that all of that is going to uh, degrade your group's morale. So if you are doing stuff like that, you're going to have to weigh the duration of your patrol versus like, just that that constant fatigue, that cum those cumulative effects of being out there, lack of sleep, being you know bit by insects, being out in the heat, being soaking wet, etc. So you know you gotta. I'm not gonna say you need a you need to just have short patrols because otherwise you're not gonna get anything done. You're not gonna get anywhere. But understand that the duration of your patrol should kind of be gauged off of are these conditions really shitty? Like can we accomplish this mission within this time? Or should we push it off to a day where we know we're going to have a little bit better conditions or the guys are a little more rested? So don't ever forget that. Uh, performance degrades as time goes on, and so does morale. The final point of METC is uh, C for civilian considerations. I, I kind of touched upon these earlier, uh, but I'll just do a very brief overview again. Um, wetlands are very sportsman-centric. At least in my area, you have fishing as the greatest draw to wetlands. Uh, sport fishing in South Florida is unmatched by anywhere else in the U.S. But at any time, fishermen, hunters, hikers, campers can call the wetlands home. Um, like I said, in the American South, they call it their... Uh, some people call it their playground, others call it their bread basket. Some people do depend on the food they get from wetland areas to survive. So they're going to be out there. They're going to be civilian forces present, both, you know, one-off or small groups that are out there, recreational, hunting, fishing, etc. To commercial elements, you know, you might have commercial fishermen going, taking trawlers up rivers or setting up crab or lobster pots up some of the saltwater waterways going into wetland areas so just understand that don't if you can avoid them that's perfect uh, don't don't interfere with what they're doing uh, if you come across some of that stuff on patrol that's not great um don't don't mess with it don't you don't want to be around those areas because uh, someone put them there they'll eventually be coming back to come get it like i said earlier law enforcement Patrols all these areas by airboat, truck, helicopter, plane, drone, depending on where you're at. So again, avoid them. Your training exercises are always going to look very suspect if you're in full kit. Even if you're in the guise of hunters, uh, like a hunter's outfit, you're, you're disguising yourself as a camper, or hiker, or whatever. Just understand that any interaction with them, if they do search you, if there is something more than just like a, a very like brief talking to you're going to land yourself in some issues. Um, even if they don't say anything to you, but they do see you in full kit, full multicam, AR-15s, helmets, etc. They don't say anything to you because they don't want to or they're afraid or whatever reasoning they have, they don't care. They're, they're probably going to mention it to their friends. And uh, their friends are also going to be patrolling those areas because usually that's their, you know, I'm not going to say it's their beat, but it's it's something akin to that. That's the area that they're assigned, their area of responsibility. So they'll be on the lookout for... Once they see you once, even if they don't say anything, they'll be on the lookout for dudes out there in multicam with ARs. So um, you'll be spoken about behind closed doors. And uh, any game cameras spot you, which there probably are a ton out there, if it's an area that's hunted heavily, understand that those game cameras might see you, and uh, you might end up on a forum post somewhere. You might end up on the internet, on YouTube, etc. You might even end up on the news, depending on how froggy the person is so understand that it's not just it's not just worrying about people out there you have game cameras you have cctv if you're walking close to property lines or even buildings you're going to have those cameras out there and those are all things to consider things to not mess with but things to avoid um that's going to be your best tactic for those uh understand that you're also planning around tournaments and seasons uh down here uh, 
fishing tournaments or a big one where you're going to all of a sudden have a ton of boats going up and down those waterways trying to find, you know, the prize winning fish hunting season. You're going to have those weekends or those weeks where you're going to have hunters out there. I know down in my area, mini lobster season and lobster season, you've got people skirting all of the all of the waterways trying to get their uh, their fill of lobsters and trying to get the, you know, the most adequate lobster be it like size or quantity for whatever they're trying to do. While stuff like that does give you a good disguise opportunity and it's a good backdrop to kind of like, you know, you can hide among the noise. Just understand that if someone stops you, you're, you're going to have to have that alibi yet again. Or if you look weird compared to all the people out there, you know, if there's a ton of fishermen and you're out there again, hiking with an AR, it's going to, it's going to arouse some suspicions. So you're going to draw a ton of attention even if you're in an area that would otherwise be desolate. So just bear that in mind. In conclusion, get, excuse me, in conclusion guys, those are gonna be what I think are some of the uh, kind of a primer to your planning phase, your planning considerations when you're out in the wetlands. Those, these are all things that I think you should be thinking about if you're gonna go out on a training patrol, if you're gonna go out on an actual patrol for whatever reason, you know, things have fallen apart, you're defending your homestead and all of the property you bought is swampland or, you know, whatever else you need to go out on a hunting expedition because the supermarkets are empty. These are all things to consider. Uh, it's not an all encompassing guide, but it's about, it's about as, uh, as much as I can kind of gauge that would cover the most, cover the most, uh, necessities. Um, just understand that most of my experience is South Florida wetlands, Floridian wetlands. Uh, th this will change. If you're in Louisiana, you might have a completely different experience. If you're in Georgia, you might have a different experience. If you're dealing with Arctic wetlands or, you know, something in the tundra that just happens to be wet, uh, you know, I don't know. You're, you're, you might have a different, a different go at things. And what I might be saying isn't going to be of much help to you, but uh, like I've said before, I try to make these videos mostly for the American civilian. Uh, you military guys have entire schools you can go to, law enforcement, I'm sure you cross train or you'll draw upon any military experience you have. And if you don't, you know, maybe you gauge something from this, maybe you don't. Just understand that, as always, this content is mostly for, you know, the regular Joe that works a 9 to 5, the, the working class hero, that sort of thing. The dude that, you know, has to go bust his ass out and then pay a mortgage to some scumbags who, you know. Anyways, um, part three is going to be probably more exciting for you guys. This will be kind of like tips and tricks while you're on patrol. Uh, it'll be less of, th this is, I'll admittedly say it, this is kind of like trite material to most of you guys. This is more for those leaders around you or those of you who deign yourselves as leaders or planners or whatever you're 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 in charge of your own area and you're kind of like this video is more for them part three is going to be for everyone if you're setting foot out there and this is going to be those little lessons learned things that i've come across that i've figured are just things people should know it'll probably be a lot shorter too anyways guys until next time stay safe